All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book, Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. All right, y'all. Introducing independent journalist Sam Husseini. He has been writing about the possible lab origins of the coronavirus since at least February of 2020. And he's got uh, many great articles about it, including averting our gaze from biowarfare. And contrary to claims, the pandemic may have come from a lab. That one ran originally at Salon.com and uh, is a, a very in-depth study of the thing. And, uh, well, and he certainly brings uh, a unique take to this, something that I haven't heard anywhere else, and that is the Pentagon's involvement in subsidizing the gain-of-function research, which apparently may have had something to do with the uh, origin of this virus. So welcome to the show, Sam. How are you doing? Great to be with you, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Uh, very happy to have you here. So um, I take it from uh, reading these articles, you already knew a little bit about this and had real concerns about germs escaping from laboratories and affecting the broader public, you know, for quite a while before COVID broke out. So you had a lot of educated questions uh, that needed to be answered where a lot of other people were just groping in the dark. Is that right? That is right. And it's for two reasons. One, I remember the anthrax attacks in 2001. People might remember after the 9-11 attacks, uh, a week later, there started to, to be anthrax attacks. Somebody was putting um, anthrax in the mail uh, to journalists and other individuals, including lawmakers. And it was depicted as coming from evil Arabs and Muslims. It was used to, you know, ramp up uh, the, our, the perpetual wars we're still in and the so-called Patriot Act and civil liberties restrictions and so on. It ended up coming out of a U.S. or a U.S. allied lab. Um, the person that the FBI alleged eventually tried to pin it on um, committed uh, allegedly committed suicide. So there was never a trial. Um, in addition, there were concerns around the um, U.S. labs in West Africa in 2014 um, uh, that uh, many Africans alleged were behind the Ebola outbreak uh, in 2014. Mm -hmm. So th those and a general concern about so-called gain of function research. Gain of function is an insidious euphemism. It, it means gain of threat. It means the creation of potentially pandemic pathogens. It means that you have scientists um, that the uh, NIH and other U.S. government agencies have funded that try to make a virus that, that is you know, perhaps deadly but not very transmissible, more transmissible. Um, so there becomes a greater threat, um, potentially unleashing a pandemic for the alleged purpose of um, uh, of combating it, uh, if it were to arise in nature, or if the evil terrorists were to unleash it um, upon us, uh, uh, Francis Boyle, who wrote the U.S. implementing le legislation for the Bioweapons Convention, um, has said that this work violates that convention, um, and he has condemned the scientists participating in it in the most vociferous manner possible. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, in your writing, you make a lot of the word games and semantics that are played and exploited by those in denial here. And they will always say, this was something that uh, was even blatant, say, right around a year ago. I remember Tucker Carlson uh, on his TV show talking about how, you know, the debunkings were saying, this is definitely not an engineered bioweapon. And Tucker Carlson is saying, yeah, but nobody ever said, or that's not part of the argument. Maybe at some very fringe website somewhere, someone brought that up. But the accusation wasn't that it was an engineered bioweapon. It was that 
maybe it had escaped from a lab where people were doing the kind of research you're talking about, where they're making it more deadly in the name of being able to research how to destroy it and deter it and protect people from it. And so it's kind of an obvious red herring argument evading the point. And you, you're much more specific. You talk about the difference between engineering a virus versus going through the generational process of, you know, these kinds of things. And how when these scientists are debunking, quote unquote, debunking the theory that this might have come from the lab, they hide behind these semantics, um, not just on bioweapons, but even on saying, well, it wasn't engineered. But that would mean, you know, gene splicing or whatever, where as just doing generations of ferret infections is, doesn't count as engineering, that kind of thing. Am I right about that? Um, largely, yeah. I mean, they, they are using engineered when it's convenient to them um, in a very specific way that constricts it. You know, when they, if it's proven, and I don't think it's been definitively proven that there's no bioengineering involved in this, um, but if it's proven that it's not bioengineered, that doesn't mean that it didn't come out of a lab. It could have come out of a lab through other processes, including, as you indicate, serial passage, where you take a virus and then pass it through a series of animals. Ferrets have a respiratory system that's similar to humans. And this was actually what was done in 2011 by a couple of scientists with the avian flu. And it caused, um, you know, some concern. Uh, I, I mean, the, the New York Times actually had an editorial at the time saying an engineered doomsday, um, uh, you know, using this you know, serial passage thing. But I also think the term bioweapon is, is, is sort of a buzzword. I mean, look, you know, I, I remember an episode in The Sopranos where um, Tony Soprano uh, sees a nemesis of his and he grabs, there's a some construction going on or something, and he grabs a nail gun and he attacks the guy with a nail gun. Well, the nail gun wasn't designed to be a weapon, but it is a weapon. So... You know, it's a largely semantic game. If you say that, oh, I'm not creating a weapon here, I'm just simply making a virus more deadly so that I can protect against it. Well, that to me starts sounding like you're saying, oh, I want to invade Iraq because I want to bring democracy there. Well, you know, your stated goals and your actual goals might be quite different. You might need to say that something is a motivation for you um, when your actual motivation is something altogether more nefarious. Now, we can't get inside these people's heads, but there are laws in place, the Bioweapons Convention and U.S. law implementing it, which the author of it says this type of work violates. In other and words, the, it's all dual use. And so here's the Correct. giant loophole. We can make whatever germ weapons we want in the name of one day, if we were faced with something like this, we have to know how to protect from it. Exactly, exactly. And it's all largely um, uh, Pentagon and USAID funded. Um, the, 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 the notion that the pandemic uh, came, uh, it, it, that it's a conspiracy theory that it came out of a lab, was largely driven by Peter Daszak, who's head of Eco Health Alliance, which mm -hmm. sounds like a nice earthy, crunchy group. Except what they do is go around the world trying to collect deadly viruses and juice them up for these purposes, um, uh, or, or we don't know what for purposes. And they, uh, as you know, has been reported, especially in right wing media, he uh, funded the lab in. Uh, uh, Wuhan uh, for this work. Um, and now he gets a ton of U.S. government money. Most of it is not from the NIH. Most of it is from the Pentagon and USAID. And USAID isn't so much an aid agency as, you know, it's sort of a soft power, um, you know, right. a, a sort of more suave version of the, you know, you know, I mean, they do spook stuff. They run out of the State Department, but they do stuff to undermine so-called U.S. enemies uh, around the world. So the, the sources of this funding, um, you know, at least since 2013, he's gotten at least $80 million uh, from the Pentagon and mm. from USAID for this work. And can you clarify uh, for us, Sam, how you know that? Uh, I had 
well, I approached them. They wouldn't give me their numbers. Um, I, uh, I got the USAID number by approaching their academic partners at the University of California. And unlike Eco Health Alliance, they got back to me with the USAID numbers. And the other numbers, I had two interns slave over government databases uh, for several months. And right. I wrote this all up for Independent Science News in December of uh, 2020. And you uh, show your I, work in the articles. I want to mention to people when they read them, they can see the evidence for your assertions and the tables and the totals there. So go ahead. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so um, what's... And, 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 you know, a large part of this has been driven by the revered uh, Anthony Fauci. Um, there was a surge of funding for this kind of dangerous lab work after 9-11, ironically, because the actual anthrax attacks were out of a U.S. lab. So they, they took that as a pretext to actually increase the funding of what caused the problem. Um and in 2015, there was a petition by some 700 scientists pleading with the NIH to stop funding this kind of dangerous lab work so much while they are ignoring other problems of pressing human and health needs. And Anthony Fauci responded to them. And he basically said, the, the American people through their elected representatives, he's referring to the Bush-Cheney administration there, have made it known that they want this work done. Now, this work can either be done through, um, you know, the Pentagon or other secretive agencies, or it can be done through the NIH and we can have a seat at the table. Uh, I'm paraphrasing there. So he was basically telling these scientists to put on their big boy pants and uh, get with the program and that if they wanted to get some real cash, they had to go along with this. And this has completely perverted, as that letter feared it would, they, they say that you're, you're deforming the scientific field because it no longer becomes a field of scientific inquiry. It becomes a field of how can you um, talk about what you do in terms of bio defense so that you can get more cash from the NIH or the Pentagon or USAID or whoever. So it's totally deformed the field. So it's not really science anymore in significant part. It is how to, how to write a grant. And less and less scientists have been willing to speak out against this. Um, I mean, you had the case of Mark Lipsitch, who's now finally speaking out. He, he's been warning for years about the, you know, the dangers of what he calls in his academic writing, he's at Harvard, potential pandemic pathogens. When the outbreak happened, he was completely silent. He wouldn't say a damn word. Um, you know, I was, you know, tweeting at him like, you know, what the hell, man? Um, and so finally he's started saying something in the most tepid terms. And I, I think at least part of it is a reflection, um, of the, the funding dictates and the fact that, you know, Fauci and others have been such staunch proponents of this kind of, of dangerous lab work. Um, and you further, um, you, you know, the, another pillar was the nature medicine article, um, and uh, people like Meryl Nass, who runs the anthrax vaccine blog. Uh, you know, yeah, I've interviewed her before about the anthrax case. Oh, wonderful. I'm pretty uh, sure. I mean, so have you re interviewed her since the pandemic broke out? Uh, I don't think so, no. I'd recommend you do so because she was the first person to call bullshit on the, um, on that, uh, on the Nature Medicine article. And, you know, now you're having emails come out between Anderson, one of the authors of it, and Fauci where Anderson actually initially, you know, seemed to be saying that, that, that he wasn't so sure about all of this. In, in any case, so she, she was the first person to say this Nature Medicine article, which said that it couldn't have come out of a lab, basically, um, was at least incredibly disingenuous. And I quote her in my first salon piece of a year ago. And for, for her efforts, she, she's gotten silenced and shadow banned and so on. She has done cutting edge work on bio warfare. She was, I believe, the first person to show um, an instance of bio warfare in the post-World War II world of uh, an attack in Rhodesia, Rhodesia against African farmers there, mm. um, of, of anthrax. Um, so, you know, th there's a, a clique of very well-funded scientists who have, in concert with 
you know, Facebook and other big tech attempted to silence people. Uh, the big media totally went along with it. Now, some of the right wing um, ha have gotten some decent information out, but it's been largely in a framework of, um, you know, going after China. Right. Um, and, that you know, in, in effect, in either explicitly or implicitly arguing that the Chinese labs are uniquely dangerous. That's not accurate. It, this type of lab work is dangerous no matter where it happens, by whatever country. And it's really been the United States that has driven um, the, 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 what, what, what I argue uh, is effectively a bioweapons arms race. You know, people think that the genie of bioweapons was put back in the bottle. But by getting around um, the restrictions on bioweapons through these series of pretexts, um, they, in effect, have let it out of the bottle. And the U.S. has hindered efforts at the United Nations, including the Obama administration, um, to stop this. Um, so it's quite possible that the Chinese were sort of trying to catch up with the United States in this regard. And they might have slipped on a banana peel. I do not exclude the possibility that this could have been um, intentionally released, uh, either to frame the Chinese labs in some manner. Um, I'm not saying that that's what happened. I just think that we need to approach this methodically and um, uh, rigorously because there has clearly been attempts by Peter Daszak and others in order to... Uh, effectively enact a, a cover-up as to the possibilities um, of, of lab origin of the current pandemic uh, to hide a, a wider problem in terms of this dangerous um, uh, biolab work. Well, and that's putting it politely. Daszak was the guy that organized the letter in The Lancet a year ago that said that this is nonsense and no one should believe it and therefore and Facebook should censor it, etc. Exactly. And, and, you know, most of the media bought that look, hook, hook, line and sinker. I mean, I, right around the time that that Lancet letter appeared, I asked the CDC um, about this uh, at a press conference at the, uh, uh, at, at the press club, and they gave an incredibly disingenuous answer. And then remarkably, Peter Daszak was put on both the Lancet and WT, WHO committees to investigate the, um, the origins of the pandemic. Uh, um, and he was put on the, um, the Lancet Committee by Jeffrey Sachs, who I just heard on Democracy Now!, which is remarkable. Uh, the day after Trump talked about, um, you, know, uh, you know, indicated that, that he thought maybe it came out of a lab, um, uh, Democracy Now! had Peter Daza on to dismiss that possibility. Uh, the, the, you know, Democracy Now! and so much of the other media um, spent last year talking about Peter Daszak as if he was a source and not a suspect hmm. because, you know, he, he had, quote unquote, knowledge of the situation. Well, that knowledge included funding the lab and the fact that he wasn't viewed um, incredibly critically um, um, uh, by a whole plethora of media um, is just. A, a remarkable instance uh, 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 of, you know, the highest order yeah. uh, uh, of completely derelict journalism, in my view. Hold on just one second. Be right back. So you're constantly buying things from Amazon.com. Well, that makes sense. They bring it right to your house. So what you do, though, is click through from the link in the right-hand margin at scotthorton.org, and I'll get a little bit of a kickback from Amazon's end of the sale. Won't cost you a thing. Nice little way to help support the show. Again, that's uh, right there in the margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, you want to know what industry is recession-proof? Yes, you're right, of course, pot. Scott Horton here to tell you about Green Mill Supercritical Extractors. The SFE Pro and Super Producing Parallel Pro can be calibrated to produce all different types and qualities of cannabis crude oils for all different purposes. These extractors are the most important part of your cannabis oil business. For precision, versatility, and efficiency. GreenMillsSuperCritical.com Hey y'all, Scott here to tell you about Zipix toothpicks. They're full of nicotine is the thing about it. Personally, I miss the stuff terribly and I'm really looking forward to getting back on it. Seems like they'd be perfect for smokers and vapors who can't afford to stop work and go outside for a break all the time, or for those traveling in planes, trains, and buses, and ferries and such. 
It's the most affordable way to get your nicotine on the market, and they taste great and come in all different flavors. Use promo code Scott Horton and get 10% off Zipix Toothpicks at ZipixToothpicks.com. So I don't know if you saw this, Sam, but um, the Washington Post reporter slash opinion haver Josh Rogan was has right. put out a new book about this, and he was interviewed on the Joe Rogan show. Uh, no I relation, that, different yeah. spelling, but there you go. Um, yeah. And one of the things that he talked about was when Redfield, the head of the CDC, said, and I'm not sure the timeline on this, uh, you could help me out with the date, but at, at some point, Redfield said, geez, I don't know, it looks like it might have come out of a lab to me. And Josh Rogan's take on that was, listen, he was flashing a bright red siren light at us there. You know, he was saying he knows he wasn't just being general, like, geez, this could have come out of a lab somewhere. He knew everything about this process. And essentially, the truth of it all would be highly classified. He would not be allowed to say, I know that this is what happened at this lab. It must have been in such a specific way. But that for him to say, geez, kind of looks like it must have been something like that to me is the same thing. That's him saying as much as he can, but essentially confirming to the, to the degree possible that this is also what he thinks it must be the answer is that right do you think that 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 could be right um you know i i i i in my reporting i have not depended on the statements of u.s government officials um you know i i tend to view their statements as potentially self-serving but i think they are worth paying attention to what i what i don't quite understand or i'm not sure about is, you know, if the Trump administration had that kind of evidence, why didn't they release it before the election? The, did, you, did you see the new Vanity Fair piece that's all about the government, the internal government reaction to all of this? And the the, the one that starts profiling the drastic group, uh, right. the Twitter group. Yeah, I, I haven't gone through the whole thing yet. Yeah. Um, so it's but, basically, yeah. you know, government is a government program, right? So you got the State Department, you got the NSC, you have the, the CIA and the FBI and whoever, and they're all doing their own different independent takes and they're all contradicting each other and stepping all over each other. And and then Donald Trump goes out and says, China, China. And then as she puts it in the article, this generated an antibody response inside the government. That if Trump is saying China, China, then that means that they all need to find out a reason why it's not their fault, just as reaction to him, because that was their job as the fourth branch of government was to undermine the elected president at every opportunity, no matter what. Possibly. But I mean, th there was that tendency even before Trump said anything um, in a lot of quarters. Right. Um, Although he did say it pretty and, early on. So that was enough, apparently, to really disrupt any honesty. And, and just like you're saying with the scientists themselves, it's, there's so many conflicts of interest everywhere, right? The State Department and USAID are putting a bunch of money into this. If the Pentagon is putting $40 million, or I think he said double that or something earlier, $80 million over a certain time period. It, 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 it's it's just, just to EcoHealth Alliance, they're, they're, they're putting oh, uh, $40 million. But that, that, you know, EcoHealth Alliance is just a small chunk of, of the overall picture. I got so, you. So I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. sure, I'm sure it's in the billions of dollars. Right. But so, and, and that's really, essentially, that's the story in the, in the uh, Vanity Fair piece is that the government was just dragging ass all year long and didn't want to come to the conclusion that would serve the president. They had to hang this that, around his neck no matter what. And that's not a defense of him by me. That's just an accusation against them by me and by her, yeah, I no, guess. I, 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 tr I trust Trump and Fauci and the CIA about the same amount. Sure. Um, so, I mean, I mean, right now you're seeing the similar dynamics. I think that different arms of the establishment want different things. One thing um, is to protect the edifice of doing this dangerous lab work. Um, and the other thing is to use this story to some extent, at least, as leverage over China. Um, and I, I think that they're sort of, you know, cutting a series of deals as to how much and when they do each of those things. And uh, what, what, I, what I think is clear is that virtually none of these government operatives or agencies have any interest in, you know, actually, uh, you know, getting the truth 
of the situation out and in protecting the people of the world right. from from this thing. I mean, if the avian flu got out, the estimate is not the devastation that we've seen in whatever it is, 3 million people uh, dead from COVID. If it's the avian flu that gets out, the estimate is 1.6 billion with a B. That, that's what we're talking about here in terms of the dangers of this uh, type of lab work. Uh, the, uh, when I say the avian flu, I mean the juiced up version of the mm -hmm. avian flu that NIH funding um, helped create uh, at, by scientists in the Netherlands and at the University of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. This is where we started uh, with the ferrets, right? And you wrote quite a bit about that. Uh, and, and in fact, I don't know, maybe a quarter of all you're writing here is block quotes of other extremely important scientists saying this is so dangerous. This is we should not be doing this, even for all the alleged possible benefits. You're really playing with worse than H-bomb fire here. Correct. Yeah, I, I think that this is a, a, an existential threat that, that probably exceeds, you know, nuclear at, the, at this point it's like the terminator um, right like geez if we can create skynet let's do it without without ever saying but yeah but this could be the end of us all right or jurassic park or something like yeah. that you know it's like you know they, they, they figured they could do something and they never sat down to think about if they should do it and they're doing it driven by funding driven by geopolitical gain uh, driven by um, doing dangerous lab work in third world countries that don't know how to protect themselves or are too weak to protect themselves. Um, uh, and, um, you know, for, the, for, their, for their own egos and to, uh, you know, profits of, you know, companies that scientists start up, start up in the hopes of getting massive um, uh, government contracts. Yeah. Um, that's a large part of what's fueling this. Yeah. All right. So uh, can you tell us about David Franz or Franz? Who's he? Um, he's one of several individuals involved in this. He used to uh, be at the um, uh, at Fort Detrick, the largest so-called biodefense facility in uh, Maryland. Um, and he's an advisor to EcoHealth Alliance. He uh, recently wrote a piece, or at some point last year, wrote a piece with the infamous um, uh, Judy Miller, um, who, of course, you know, got a lot of lies about Iraq WMDs into the New York Times before the invasion of Iraq. Um, and um, uh, they co-wrote a piece basically saying that you needed to fund biowarfare uh, slash biodefense stuff more. Um now, uh, what was particularly interesting to him about, to, to, to me about him, was that he, with Judy Miller, even after the invasion of Iraq, kept going on about um, the, uh, there being mobile up weapons labs in Iraq. That, that's why we couldn't find the WMDs, because they were in these mobile weapons labs and we had to track them down. And they were still floating this. Uh, possibility uh, after the invasion of Iraq, because it, you know, if they could have sold that story, then they would have, um, you know, you know, effectively tried to justify the invasion. Say, you know, you know, everybody was saying, where, where are the weapons of mass destruction were that you kept talking about? Um, uh, that that story was effectively debunked by David Kelly, a uh, a scientist a scientist in Britain. Um, uh, he, uh, apparently, uh, exposed information to the BBC that exposed that story as false and therefore put sort of the last kibosh on, uh, the justifications for the Iraq war in terms of weapons of mass destruction. And then he ended up being found dead of an alleged suicide shortly thereafter. Um, uh, you've had other cases of alleged suicides um, pertaining to U.S. bioweapons uh, work. Um, uh, you, you had uh, the case of Frank Olson, um, who it now appears uh, in the 1950s was, attempt, was considering blowing the whistle on apparent U.S. government use of bioweapons in Korea. 
um, he ended up dying by um, falling from a New York City skyscraper. Um, the story that they put out, that the government put out upon Frank Olson's death, was that it was an LSD experiment that had gone wrong, that he and some other scientists to try to experiment with the effects of LSD took it, he freaked out, and he threw himself outside the window. That incredibly elaborate story all seems to be a ruse. Yeah. Um, there was there's actually a fascinating Netflix um, multi-part documentary on this uh, featuring his son and featuring uh, Cy Hirsch. Um, it's called Wormwood, if anybody wants to look at that. It's really great. It's both entertaining and educational. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, what, what apparently was the case was that Frank Olson was going to blow the whistle on U.S. use in some capacity. And I'm sorry, just a side note here, but it's got to be mentioned, Sam, that that story, aside from being a limited hangout and preventing the truth about the bioweapons program coming out, uh -huh. that also became the basis for this old wives tale that LSD causes people to jump off of roofs and out of windows and die. And then uh -huh. that translates directly to entire lifetimes wasted languishing in filthy, rotten cages simply for possessing LSD or for selling LSD. There's essentially no limit to the number of deadheads that got entrapped into something like life sentences for selling acid over this. This basic limited hangout lie became the scare story that made, you know, people who had no idea about it and no experience with it themselves at all believe that acid makes people crazy and suicidal and what if your son jumped off a roof and so it we have to this has to be a felony to have just a little bit and i'm sorry it's just a parenthesis but it's just an atrocity i mean we're talking about decades upon decades upon decades of people punished for this and now they go oh actually you know what taking mushrooms and lsd is a really good way to stop being depressed and suicidal and to get over abuse trauma and all of these things. It turns out the hippies were right all along how beneficial this stuff can be under the right circumstances. But anyway. That's fascinating. I mean, I, I feel like so much of this stuff has that mentality of, in effect, making either other people or nature the enemy rather than in us scrutinizing these militarized institutions. Right. They end Absolutely. up being the threat and they point to all of these other threats, whether it's foreigners or ethnic minorities or nature itself is going to come after you or something like LSD. I, I know I, I hadn't thought about what you were saying, but it kind of fits into a general framework, a general pattern that I've seen in terms of how the, the scaremongering that goes on right. through here and through that scaremongering, um, the establishment, you know, effectively coerces people into going along with their militarized agenda. And, you know, there are really good guys on our side who are really worried about this narrative taking hold because the yellow peril is in fashion again. If it ain't Russia, it's China. And if it ain't one or the other, it's both the new enemy right. and sometimes Iran. But, hey, those scary Easterners and you can't get more East than the Chinese. Boy, so... Um, and people are terrified yeah. of it and people like being terrified of it. I was a guest on the Tim Pool show and I basically just, nah, you know, China ain't so bad. I ain't afraid of them kind of thing. It's all right. We can get along. And the audience reaction was just, you know, they're right leaning people in the comment section and their heads just exploded. It was like if in 2002, I was saying Saddam Hussein was harmless and they're just right. having a heart attack about it. They just can't believe it. How could you be so pro Chinese communist and, and, and favor their victory over our own civilization so badly because they're all they're just begging the question. They just know it's true that China's going to take over the world. And that means us, too. And right. so then this plays into that. Oh, my God, they unleashed this germ, which, you know, there seems to be something to the idea that they held open the airports and encouraged people to come home for the Chinese New Year and then kept the airports open and sent everybody out hither and yon all over the world after the holiday was over. Which is, I that, I kind of thought that that sort of stood for, well, if this is going to happen to us, it's going to happen to everybody else too, kind of an attitude when they could have prevented that. Um, not that I'm trying to play into the Cold War, but 
does seem like part of the problem, you know? Yeah, I, I haven't really, to be honest, parsed through Chinese government actions. I, I do think that it, I would, again, caution against, you know, pinning it on the Chinese in, in two respects. One respect, this dangerous lab work it was funded by the United States, um, uh, or at least a substantial portion of it, and that it's being done and driven by the United States, and there should be global restrictions on this kind of dangerous lab work if we want to prevent or re the, the, the continuation of of this uh, existential threat to humanity. Um, and you know, uh, again, you know, given what happened with the anthrax attacks, they were a false flag. Given what happened with the Frank Olson cover story complete charade um, to cover that up. I don't think that we should exclude the possibility that the Chinese labs in some fashion were being framed. Um, uh, it would serve a lot of agendas for that to have been the case. That doesn't prove that it happened, but I think that you know it is one of the three options. Objectively speaking, the three options are A, it had nothing to do with the lab, B, it was an accident that leaked out of uh, one of the labs in Wuhan, or the um, uh, third one being that it, was, it possibly um, was some kind of intentional release, possibly to frame um, uh, those, uh, those labs uh, for strategic purposes. So I, I think that if there's going to be a genuine, independent, rigorous inquiry, it would have to consider all three of those possibilities. Yeah. Well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, it, it'll be just know. a contest of narratives, right, Sam? And then, well, no, you know. I think that there are things such as evidence and logic, and it's been remarkable to me, as, as I mentioned to you, what, what Merrill Nass did, mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, it's a small example, but, you know, uh, uh, I mean, she she called out that nature medicine article of a year ago yeah and now it, it's become completely apparent that that nature medicine article which was regurgitated through tons of media which uh, frank collins the head of the nih um basically said closes the case a year ago in, in a blog post that he wrote um uh it, it, that, that it did come from nature um you know, she, she she's an independent physician working in Maine, and she figured it out. So I think that there is the possibility here of networks of individuals, at least, if we're not going to get any any meaningful of official inquiry. And I certainly don't trust the Biden administration or um, the spook agencies that uh, will presumably continue to put out information on this. Um uh, I think that it is possible for networks of individuals to try to arrive at some uh, some some meaningful levels of truth, if not definitive answers. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think that that should be dismissed. I, I don't think we should be, you know, um, you know, completely, you know, we can be cynical about the institutions involved, but I, I don't right. think that we should dismiss the possibilities of, of parsing out the truth. I'm sure you're all, You'd agree. I mean, that's what you do. On, of course. Yeah, I'm a big believer in journalism. You know, I never read the 9-11 Commission report, but I read a hell of a lot of different reporters all about yeah. all different aspects of that thing. Came my own, made my own little report in my own head. Um, that's a very, very sensible. Very so, sensible. And, and in fact, in this case, we have a very specific example here, and it should have been you, Sam, a year ago or more. But in this case, what happened was a former science reporter from the New York Times wrote a million word piece for medium.com. And by a million, I mean, it was about what, 20,000 words or something. So this giant piece for medium.com that said, Hey, listen, this really does look like a real possibility here. And for whatever social psychological reasons, that seemed to make the difference. That was what kicked open the door. And then other reporters started asking officials about it. And they started denying it less and being more open to the possibility. And now here we are, what, three weeks later, and we're in a full-scale debate about whether this is really a thing or not, right? So uh, th That's a large chunk of what happens. I mean, I'm, I'm again, I'm a very skeptical person. I mean, the, the latest round 
uh, of interest in this, which started about a little over a week ago, I think, was um, the Wall Street Journal um, published a piece by Michael Gordon. <laughs> yeah. The infamous Michael Gordon, along with one of the former Knight Ritter reporters, it should be added. Yeah, Strobel, um, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Michael Gordon, who did a lot of uh, highly dubious reporting with Judy Miller, um, um, put out a piece, you know, citing spooks, uh, saying that uh, workers at Wuhan got uh, got sick, um, you know, the, the lab workers, indicating that COVID might have come out of the lab. Well, you know, I mean, they're, they're obviously, you know, not, it would seem like they are pursuing an agenda to, you know, target the labs in Wuhan. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, the Trump administration has, the, the, the Biden administration has, wants leverage over China the same way that Trump did, just in a less crass manner. So, um, you know, I. And I don't, I mean, all of these report like Nick Wade and others who were silent for a year, I mean, it, it's hard to know how to assess that. Was it just simply knee-jerk anti-Trumpism or was it that, you know, you know, are, are they getting their cues from, you know, government entities? I don't know what's inside these people's heads. Um, I, I'm... You know, I, I spent a good deal of last year being dismayed at the silence yeah. of so many people who should have known better. Um, and you have to question what the what the agendas at play were. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think you're right that Nick Wade piece sort of started opening the door um, on the discussion. But it really has taken off since the, you know, explicit um information coming from clearly coming from spook agencies. Right. Um, yeah, that's right. And again, I mean, the real question is why wouldn't they discuss this last year? And that was because they had to make as much of the germ Trump's fault as they possibly could for electoral politics reasons. And essentially the entire establishment, including the Republicans, uh, you know, not necessarily Fox news, but everybody else on the right, we're all trying to get rid of Donald Trump. And so uh, yeah, I think they just didn't I, want to run with anything that would diffuse the responsibility from him. I think I think that's part of it. But I also think that, I mean, imagine if the public were aware, you know, in February of last year that this could have come out of a lab, you know, and there was objective reporting around that. I think that there would have been a nationwide and global mass demand to end this dangerous lab work, you know? And I mean, that agenda goes far beyond Trump. Right. So I think that there are very deep seated interests who wanted to keep that off the public agenda. Yeah. No, so that's a very good point. That, and, that, that, and that they have succeeded, happen. right? We have not been discussing, well, what is going to happen with, the Pentagon money and the NIH money and the State Department money going towards these things. Right, right. I mean, the, the, these, I mean, the genius of Trump was to seem to play against the establishment while effectively backing it up. Right. Um, which is kind of similar to what Obama did. Right. Um, and they accepted um, yeah. all of his favors while still opposing him anyway and doing everything they could to undermine him anyway. Sort of, but in a limited way. I mean, you know, they didn't undermine him for you know, um, you know, uh, for the Jerusalem move or, um, you know, <laughs> well, uh, you got that right. <laughs> you know, I mean, they, 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 they only undermined him for, you know, they spent three years on Russia gate, which was, was a complete farce. So it, right. it, it's, um, I'm reminded of your book fool's errand. Um, yeah, so, somehow giving away Golan, which wasn't his to give away was just totally kosher yeah. over at the post and the times. That's fine. And if he talks about getting out of Afghanistan, you oppose him on that, you know. So um, uh, and then he never delivers on that. He doesn't get out of Afghanistan. Right. right. So, um, you know, he, he plays against NATO. And then so all the liberals got to back up NATO. It, it, it was a sort of, you know, 
it, it was kind of a stroke of genius on the part of the establishment to use Trump as a foil um, to sort of further entrench it. And I think that that happened in spades in in this case by him talking about you know the possibility of lab origin that sort of sealed the deal he was already there as i said but that sort of sealed the deal as you indicate yeah um that 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 was an insane unthinkable thought yeah um and and i think that that was completely tragic it it certainly shut down you know a lot of so-called progressives and a lot of so-called anti-war people even people who you know were critical of the whole russia gate narrative you know max blumenthal and others um all you know jumped on the bandwagon that lab origin was a conspiracy theory um and you know it, it just shows to what degree so much so-called journalism is just reflexively anti it, it's sectarian it, it, it's you know it's just playing against what faction you don't like it's not assessing evidence it's not looking at history Right. And um, I, I think so. I think that we've seen a, a complete failure of the scientific community, of the global legal framework around bioweapons, uh, around journalism, and we've seen how um, uh, big tech, euphemistically sometimes called social media, um, is used to mold public opinion rather than. Uh, be a tool for empowering uh, individuals. Yeah. And listen, I mean, that really is one of the most important buried headlines in this whole story is the level of censorship by Google and Facebook. And I'm not sure if Twitter was banning people for saying this or not. Um, Certainly people are being censored by Google. I mean, YouTube, the all important YouTube. Uh, Right. For a year, this thing that's now perfectly debatable by the Post and the Times for a year would get you or your mom kicked off of Facebook for talking about it. It's crazy that they would do that. What is this, China? This is supposed to be the United States of America, for God's sake. Right, and they've set up this structure where, uh, you know, free speech rights don't exist on these privatized networks, but they, in effect, coordinate with government entities. So it's sort of the worst of both worlds. Yep. Um, so that they, 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 you, you don't have First Amendment rights. Um, uh, they get to utilize this for their personal profit. They know everything about you. You know nothing about them. Um, and it, it really is genuinely um, dystopian. Um, so I, I think that, you know, there are so many threads that, that, that are, you know, screaming uh, for major reforms um and, and that that's very top very near the top of the list yeah absolutely all right you guys check out sam husseini he's at husseini.posthaven.com questioning the cdc origin of the pandemic and biowarfare he's got a whole list of uh, articles there and also including contrary to claims the pandemic may have come from a lab and averting our gaze from bio warfare, pandemics, and self fulfilling prophecies. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Sam. Great to talk to you. People can just go to plain old org. That'll take them to that page. Thanks so much for okay. having me on, Scott. Great. Husseini.org. Y'all appreciate it. The Scott Horton Show, Anti War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA, APSradio.com, Anti War.com, ScottHorton.org and libertarianinstitute.org.